into the night. They're still going now, as you can see, and maybe into the early hours. It's the latest, the last showdown between MPs and peers over the government's Rwanda bill. But it is expected to be passed tonight. Stay with us for live coverage as the standoff continues. Piers sent the safety of Rwanda bill back to the Commons for a fifth time where MPs are voting. Today, the Prime Minister was in determined mood. He now says multiple flights to Rwanda will take off this July. If that happens, will they act as a deterrent? And what will all this do for Rishi Sunak's electoral fortunes? We'll talk to Nick, who's live in Parliament, and we'll talk to Conservatives. And our Newsnight panel are here too. Could there be a summer election, even if flights do take off? Also tonight, Donald Trump on day one of his trial in New York, accused of covering up hush money paid to adult film star Stormy Daniels. It's the first time a US president, current or former, has faced a criminal trial. Hello, good evening. It could be a long night for MPs in the Commons and peers in the House of Lords because of the latest standoff over the government's Rwanda bill. But it is expected to clear its final parliamentary hurdle in the early hours. The ping pong will end. And when it does, Rishi Sunak claims this will then happen immediately. Starting from the moment that the bill passes, we will begin the process of removing those identified for the first flight. So that was at a press conference earlier in anticipation of the bill being passed tonight. Mr Sunak claimed the drumbeat of multiple flights each month would begin in 10 to 12 weeks. So July, the summer, definitely not the spring, which he'd previously promised. He blamed the delay on, quote, Labour peers in the House of Lords. Labour say the government were trying to make, quote, grubby political capital out of a delay. Let's talk to Nick, who is at Westminster. What's happening right now, Nick? Well, Vic, as you said, MPs are voting right now on the last House of Lords amendment we have on this. We started out before Easter with 10. We're now down to one. This is the Lord Hope Amendment, now the Lord Anderson Amendment, that would oblige the government in future to consult with a, a monitoring body on declaring Rwanda a safe country. We're expecting that vote in the next few, in the next few minutes. Of course, the government will win that vote. Vote. It will then go down there to the House of Lords. Peers are expected to start considering that at 11.30 p.m. The minister, I think it's um, Lord Sharp of Epsom, will have to say, well, this is why MPs decided to overturn this. It is expected that that will only take a few minutes. And the reason for that, it is not expected at 11.30 that there will be any amendments, any more amendments from the House of Lords going back to the House of Commons. And that means around about 11.30, that will mean that um, this bill will have passed its final parliamentary hurdles and it can then go to the King for royal assent. We've got the numbers of that vote in the last few minutes in the House of Commons. It's ayes 312, noes 237. So that is a majority of 75 for the government. So it can now, as we say, head back to the House of Lords. But you did get the distinct impression this afternoon that that the, uh, the Labour Party was not exactly spoiling for a massive fight with the government. Lord Des Brown, the former Labour Defence Secretary, he threw in the towel on exempt exempting Afghan uh, uh, veterans from this scheme. Uh, he would say, not quite throwing in the towel, he would say that he got a concession from the government, the government talking about how it would have a review, have a reassessment. He thinks that that's a big move from the government. So that's where we are right now, Vic. Thank you, Nick. Uh, brilliantly explained, as always. What does this mean in terms of the wider politics, though? Well, Vic, where we are with the politics is Rishi Sunak is absolutely determined to get this on the statute book. And uh, he was saying at his press conference today that the moment that it becomes law, it takes about 10 to 12 weeks for the flights to take off. That is uh, pretty much exactly what we reported uh, last week. And then he's saying that what you will then have is a choice before the British people later this year, he, suge he said, which suggests he's still thinking of an autumn election. And there'll be a choice 
between the Conservative Party that is offering uh, to uh, start the flights and stop the boats and the Labour Party, he says, that has no plan. Labour would say, oh, we do have a plan. It's just your, not your plan because we don't think these flights will work. What they're talking about, the Labour Party, is going upstream after the people smugglers, using counter-terrorism legislation to go after them, using intelligence to go over those parts of those European countries where these boats are made, go after them and break the people smugglers that way. That is the sort of the, how the debate will probably be framed in the general election, whenever it is. Cheers, Nick. You will be back with us, I know, to update our audience. And we are going to talk to uh, various uh, politicians in the Commons, but as you can see, they're a little busy right now. Uh, so we'll get to them as soon as we can. We are definitely, though, hours away from the Rwanda bill clearing its final parliamentary hurdle. It's been some time in the making, two years, actually, since Boris Johnson first went public with his Rwanda plan. Will it work? Here's Seema. It was in 2022 when the then Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced his plan that anybody who was to arrive here illegally would be sent to Rwanda, 4,000 miles away. But so far, no flights have taken off and people have continued to arrive in the UK by small boat, making the perilous 20-mile journey across the Channel. Figures show more than 29,000 people arrived this way last year, a fall from the previous year. However, the first three months of 2024 had the highest number of crossings for this time of year. Given the numbers crossing usually increases as the weather improves, those figures suggest we could be headed for another busy year. Rishi Sunak made stopping the boats one of his five priorities, saying today we are in the battle with callous, sophisticated and global criminal gangs who encourage people to make the life risking trip for cash. Critics say his plan is cruel and unworkable. Ending free movement and taking back control of Britain's borders was a major factor that led to the 2016 vote to leave the EU. The government wants to maintain the support of the Red Wall, many of whom voted to leave. And then there's the cost of keeping migrants in hotels and other accommodation while they wait for their asylum applications to be processed. It's costing around £8 million per day. The PM had said flights to Rwanda would take off this spring after they were blocked two years ago by European judges. That was followed by the UK Supreme Court upholding a ruling that the scheme was unlawful over fears migrants could be sent back to their country of origin, where they could be treated badly. But today, Mr Sunak said it would be 10 to 12 weeks before the flights actually take off, blaming his opponents for the delay. Some have questioned the safety of Rwanda, others whether the numbers being sent will be enough to make a difference. The available evidence suggests that asylum deterrence policies of this kind do not have a big deterrent impact, but fundamentally the deterrent effect of this policy will depend on how many people are sent to Rwanda. If that number is sufficiently large, and you'd have to think it would have to be quite large, then that may make, pe may make people think twice before getting in a small boat. The Prime Minister said an airfield was on standby and commercial planes had been booked to get the first flights off. But a Home Office source told us the backlog of asylum applications is already immense, saying, I'm sure there will be many legal challenges ahead with many of those scheduled for removal claiming mental illness to delay removal. Rishi Sunak announced he will free up 25 courtrooms and 150 judges to help process Rwanda cases. But with Crown and magistrates' courts already facing significant backlogs, it's not clear where these resources will come from. The PM says success is when the boats have been stopped. He says 200 dedicated caseworkers have been trained to process claims quickly, something a Home Office source told us would mean other areas of asylum being compromised. Let's talk live now to Conservative MP Kieran Mullen, who is a parliamentary private secretary at the Home Office. Thank you very much for talking to us, Mr Mullen. I know it's a That's busy lovely. evening. So it's set to pass tonight, finally. Royal assent potentially within days. Why then will it take three months to get a plane taking off? Well, I think the first thing to focus on is that this government is absolutely determined to deliver on this policy because we know it's what the British people want us to do. And it's, importantly, the right thing to do. At the minute, 
people smugglers are determining our asylum policy. And whatever you feel about the validity of people's claims and the role we should play in the world, I don't think anyone thinks that we shouldn't be the ones deciding who come here and, and seek asylum. I'm not privy to the detailed negotiations of exactly how the flights will work and when they'll go off, but I think everyone will see from this evening that we're absolutely determined to get this poly through and operationalise it as soon as we can. Well, we, we know when they'll, they'll take off because the Prime Minister said today it will be t 10 to 12 weeks, so the summer. Why isn't a plane ready to go? As I said, I'm not familiar with the ins and outs of exactly how we're operationalising this policy. At the end of the day, politics are about a choice. You've got this government and this Prime Minister determined to deliver, and you've got a Labour Party who's got a leader who said that all immigration policy is inherently racist, who signed a letter to oppose the deportation of a foreign criminal, who campaigned for free movement, and who actually said that even if we get this policy working, and I hope that we do, and I'm confident that we will, he'd still reverse it. Right. What if... I notice that you say, I hope that we will get it working. What if flights do take off and the boats continue to come this summer? Well, I think if we look at examples like Albania, where we made it crystal clear that only the most exceptional claims from Albania will be successful, we saw more than a 90% drop of people making that crossing from Albania. We can look at what they did in Australia, where they used a similar policy and saw a huge decrease in the number of people making the crossings. So I think there's every reason to believe this policy is going to work. That's why I've been voting for it and I support it. And for those that oppose it, what is their answer? You know, we'll there, there we'll is ask no them. Don't worry. We we'll ask them. Don't, don't worry. On the Albania example, which is regularly mentioned by uh, politicians like yourself and indeed the Prime Minister, he said today, Rishi Sunak, 90% of illegal Albanian migrants, uh, they've reduced illegal Albanian migration by 90%, which means 10% still come. So boats still come with Albanians on, despite a returns agreement with their own country. So I think if you said to the British public, do you want us to put in place a policy that's going to do at least a 90% job of tackling this problem, or carrying on with Labour's policy of doing nothing really credible to tackle it, I'm pretty sure who they'll support and but who they'll That, that they'll wasn't the question for. I asked you, though, Indeed. was it? But, I'm asking you, know, if you... What if you're you trying say, to say is that because you, we can't guarantee a policy is absolutely perfect, that we shouldn't do it. That's not my approach. No, that's no, I wasn't suggesting that either. I wasn't suggesting well, that either, forgive me. I was impaired by your question, if you don't mind saying. Yeah, no, I don't mind at all. I, I'll let, let me tell you what I w was meaning. So you say it's going to work because it will be a deterrent. I'm saying you've got an Albanian agreement in place and still 10% of Albanians come across the channel on the small boats, which suggests that even if flights do take off to Rwanda, it's not going to stop all the boats. And that was the promise from the Prime Minister. Well, I think what the Prime Minister is determined to do is to do everything we possibly can to manage that problem. And I think that further question did probably the point. You were saying that if we can't get a perfect policy, we shouldn't be doing this. Oh, As I, I said, we're determined to, to deliver on this. The Labour Party are opposed to it because they don't get people's attitude quite rightly that we cannot have people smugglers determining who actually comes and has asylum in this country. Uh, are you okay? Can you still yeah, hear me? Just about. Yeah. Um, are you expecting people being deported to physically resist? Well, well, there's all the normal procedures that are in place when it comes to deporting people. Uh, you'll find on occasions people do physically resist. And again, I don't think the British public should have it be a measure of our asylum policy whether or not someone resists deportation. If there's a legal uh, order for someone to be deported, then we should do what we ordinarily do to ensure that order is enforced. Your Deputy Foreign Secretary uh, two years ago, Andrew Mitchell, a backbencher at the time, said those being deported will physically resist. They will superglue themselves to structures. The international media will show pictures of British officials forcing desperate people, genuinely seeking asylum, onto planes. Reluctant detainees on board will be manacled and handcuffed to avoid in-flight dangers. Are you prepared for that? There are no easy options when it comes to this issue. What I'm prepared for is that we have set up and made arrangements for people to be housed in Rwanda, looked after in Rwanda with access to health care, help to find work and all those things that you would compassionately want to be in place for asylum seekers. If the answer to the question is would you use force to do this is no, then you can't have an effective asylum policy. And I think the British public would expect us to act decisively when it comes to enacting lawful decisions to deport someone. You know, as I said, Labour write letters opposing us deporting convicted foreign criminals. So I don't expect them to make those tough, hard choices, but we will. So force is OK with you? 
as I said, if you've got a deportation policy, if your answer is that if people resist it, you don't deport them, then really you can't have an effective deportation policy of any kind. You know, are we really saying that convicted criminals, for example, that are due to be deported, if they say, well, I'm not leaving, they can just get to stay? I think it's a nonsensical point. The Prime Minister today announced that there will be 25 courtrooms, 150 judges who could provide over 5,000 sitting days to deal with legal challenges. How many are you expecting? Well, I think it's better to be prepared. Uh, I, I mean, again, that's a I lot that of people, judges. I hope that people take the clear message from the policy that we're not wanting people to make that illegal crossing and expect to stay here and that they'll act accordingly. If some people don't, then of course it's right that we're prepared. The fact that you've magically found 150 judges and 25 courtrooms and they may be able to offer 5,000 sitting days uh, perhaps tells us, when we've got such a backlog, that it's a priority for you to send asylum seekers to Rwanda, more of a priority over trying alleged rapists. Well, immigration judges are not the judges that try criminal courts and the criminal court space, again, is not the same court space that's used for immigration tribunals. And I don't think it's an either or. Absolutely, we've shown repeatedly that we're willing to take tougher action when it comes to the worst, most violent offenders. Um, you can you do can't, the same you can't thing get them in a courtroom, though, can you? Well, you're, you're right to say that after the pandemic, we faced a significant backlog in court space. Unprecedented investment has gone into the justice system in order to correct that. And if part of that investment is also delivering on an important priority for the British public, then I think that's right that we do that. Thank you very much for talking Thanks. to our audience tonight. Thank you. Karen Thanks. Mullen, thank you. Right, let's talk to our Newsnight panel. We've got Times Radio broadcaster Aisha Hazarika, uh, a former Labour advisor, and soon to be introduced to the House of Lords as a Labour peer. Uh, welcome to you. And political correspondent at The Spectator, James Heal. So you're not in the Lords because you haven't been... Haven't been introduced yet. That's happening in about two weeks' time. Right, OK. I'm here tonight with you instead. Yes, I'm very <laughs> grateful. Thank you very much. Uh, James Heal, how big a moment is this for the Prime Minister? This is a big moment for the Prime Minister. I think this is the moment where we really get to see uh, the power move from out of Parliament, something where he has a majority in the House of Commons into the kind of uh, difficult world, the grey zone, of what those legal challenges are going to look like. And I think that's why the next few weeks are crucial. And I think that's why this, this morning the Prime Minister was doing a press conference really to kind of set the framing for the next three months or so and try and convince the people inside Parliament and outside it as well that he's got a plan to get through those three months. Do you think there will be a number of legal challenges? I think there will be a number of legal challenges and I felt that the press conference today was not so much a message to people at home who are very concerned about immigration. This was a party management strategy and it was sending a signal to those backbenchers who are unhappy with the Prime Minister and they're facing very difficult local elections on the 2nd of May. It felt like it was a, a message to his detractor saying, don't come for me after the May local elections. I'm going to get the Rwanda bill through. Let's see what happens in June and July. He mentioned this sort of rhythm of flights being taken off. That felt like a political management strategy, a kind of save my skin strategy, say, hold off, let's not have a leadership challenge. Also, I think it was a big signal to say, I'm not going to have a summer election either. I want to oh, have something to talk about yeah. over the summer. Because there is speculation, uh, James Hill, that there could be a summer election because the boats problem could get worse, even if a few flights take off. Absolutely. But I think that if you look at way up what the Conservative Media are talking about right now, I do think that it's very difficult right now to say, look, you're 20 points behind the polls, at least get this up and running. And I think that what Aisha talks about there, about having a rolling program of flights, is what's key to a kind of election message, which mm. is going to be you want it up and running. Because then, of course, then it's the Labour Party being asked every day, do you want to stop these apparently successful flights, etc.? And that's going to be the real challenge for them in the campaign. So I think it actually needs some time to be get up and show that it's working off the ground. And that's when you're going to have a campaign based in part around that and other things as well. From Labour's point of view, I mean, we, we hear Conservative politicians regularly say Labour don't have a plan. What we do know is that Sir Keir Starmer has said even if the Rwanda flights are working, even if the plan is working, even if it's deterring people coming on small boats, he will scrap it. If Labour do win the next election, will he really scrap it if it's working? Well, I think it, the big if is if it's working. Look, if some magic happens and these boats are stopped, and remember, the language that Rishi Sunak used again at his press conference today was very tough, it's very binary. It's not about reducing the boats. It's not even about significantly reducing the boats. It's a hard stop. It's stopping 
all of, of, of the boat. So let's see if, if this plan works. I don't think it will. But I think that whoever wins the next general election, of course, the polls are looking good for Labour. This is going to be an issue. Of course, it's going to be an issue. The problem of these small boats crossings are really serious and nobody should sort of say they're not. People in the country are worried about them. But it's it's one thing to um, have a plan and, and, and Labour has said, you know, it's got things it would do. It wants to sort of spend more time going after the gangs and working with other countries and put much more money into the sort of dealing with the backlog. But what Rishi Sunak has decided to do is something which is very performative. It's a massive sort of gimmick and it's wildly expensive as well. And I think the problem for him is that, yes, this is an issue that people do care about immigration, but people are so kind of cynical about this Rwanda scheme now. Nobody thinks it's going to magically stop all the problems. It's so wildly expensive. It is kind of like mind-bendingly weird as a policy as well. Even the Rwandans don't have that much policy. And, you know, the, the housing estate that Suella Braverman went to visit, and she said, this is amazing, this is great. We now learn that, that they've sold off a huge um, part of, of, of those houses to, to, to local people because they don't have faith. Yeah. They've, they've, they've okay. sold us. So I don't think anybody really has great faith in this scheme. Well, I think what's so striking is that the way in which the language has changed over the past two years, and I think that particularly since James Cleverly's come in as Home Secretary, it's not so much about Rwanda being seen as the silver bullet, as much more just one tool in the toolbox. Uh, and I think that's why they're kind of keen to stress things like having agreements with places like Albania, the work they're doing with European countries. And actually, I talked to a lot of Tory MPs who say, look, we need to make more of the fact that this is a European-wide element. It's not everyone just coming to Britain. And actually, if you look at kind of the boats, boats crossing going to Italy, for instance, I think they are significantly under quite a hard right leader, Maloney, as Prime Minister. So I think that actually stressing the European dimension of this is something that can help the Conservatives as much as uh, any kind of hindrance. We're going to be back with you in just a moment because we're going to talk now to former Justice Secretary, Conservative MP Sir Robert Buckland, who earlier voted against the government and for some of those Lords amendments. Uh, good evening to you, Sir Robert Buckland. Good evening. So uh, my understanding is, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong because everything keeps changing, you voted for the amendment to create a process for Rwanda's safe status to be kept under review by the Independent Monitoring Committee. Um, why don't you trust your own government's reassurances on that? Well, look, I, I think that it was very important that we use this opportunity in legislation, not only to make sure that uh, the, the, this, this act, these provisions were used in a way that was consistent with the reality that Rwanda was a safe place. And in other words, they did everything that they said they were going to do under the treaty. But also, if in the future Rwanda became unsafe, if there was a change in circumstances, there would be a mechanism here for Parliament to deal with it. Now, it does seem as if the government, you know, they, they, won't, they won't move on that. If there is to be a change in future, there'll have to be a separate a piece of legislation. I, I, I don't think that's desirable. But where I think we are now is that um, we're, we're, we're facing a fifth round of ping pong. I think it's time that the Lords accepted that, however good this argument is, it's time for the elected House to prevail. That's what I've just said in the Chamber, and that's what I hope now will happen. So we can actually concentrate not on the process here in Parliament, but on whether or not this scheme will work. Do you think it will? I think it can. I think that the scale-up of provision in terms of uh, making sure the courts are ready to deal with any challenge uh, and that the timescale the Prime Minister has now set uh, of about 12 weeks or so seems to me to be realistic. Uh, I think that it's right to say that Rwanda is only one of a series of policies to deal with a challenge that's facing not just us but the whole of the West. And it's important to remember that you know, the government is prepared to be innovative and take leadership on an issue that is taking, you know, other countries in this direction as well. And okay. Other European countries want to do the same. And I think it's right that we innovate in this way. Can I ask you to clarify something? Um, Kieran Mullen, who, who we were talking to just a moment or two ago, uh, a fellow backbench MP, said the 150 judges that have been found by Rishi Sunak to hear uh, legal challenges are different from judges that would sit in Crown Court cases. Is, is that right? I'm asking you as a former Justice Secretary. Well, I don't know precisely uh, the detail. I would imagine that the judges who will be hearing the cases will be people who have adequate training and uh, the expertise needed. You know, our judges are very adaptable. Okay. We do have a large cast.
charge of judges dealing with this type of case anyway, and the Prime Minister, I'm sure, wouldn't have announced this without the preparation having been done by colleagues in the Ministry of Justice and Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunals Service. service. So I think that that, 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 that liaison would have happened. Um, he's, the Prime Minister, once again, is showing that he's getting his sleeves rolled up and getting involved, as he did with the Albania deal that I think made such a difference to uh, the nature and quality of uh, Albanian numbers in the last year. Right. Well, that's what Prime Ministers should do, isn't it? Well, we absolutely. But uh, the point I'm making is that this is a Prime Minister who does the detail and uh, who is prepared to uh, you know, really get into the, the weeds sometimes. Right. Well, let's see and if I it works. Let's see if it works. this is the sort of yeah. issue that you do need uh, that attention to detail on. In terms of attention to detail, it was only <coughs> November that five Supreme Court justices stated that Rwanda wasn't safe for asylum seekers. Is it now? Well, of course, the judges then were looking at the situation as it applied back in the summer of 2022, just when the new policy had been announced. And I think things have moved on significantly. We saw not just a treaty being uh, agreed in November but of last year, but me, also me, progress Sir since e then. Even last week, Lord Sharp, speaking on behalf of the government in the Lords, said it was a work in progress from Rwanda's point of view. Yes, and I've been uh, holding the government to account on that and pushing to make sure that all the processes that they've agreed to in the treaty are being put in place, and that underpins some of the arguments we've had on the amendment right. that we've so just is, voted so is on. It, so is it safe for asylum seekers then? Well, I think that by the time we see asylum seekers going there, uh, it will be uh, a place which will have fulfilled its treaty obligations. I wanted the law to fully reflect that. The government have said on the floor of both houses now that they intend to make sure that the treaty is fully implemented before uh, it starts to be used. So um, we've got to take them at their word and uh, we will be looking very closely to make sure that those high standards are adhered to. OK. Voters who want to see illegal uh migration reduced who wants to see the boats stopped like do you think this policy is going to work is it going to do that well i think it will help i think that it's one of a number of measures that the government is taking so ju i'm just going to pause you forgive me forgive me i know it's it's weird because of the delay but will this stop all the boats in your view well, of itself, I don't think one particular aspect of a policy will be conclusive in stopping the boats. I think it's a range of policies, a range of tools in the box that will make the difference, which is why the government has to not only pursue this, but redouble its efforts to make sure that as a collective challenge, we deal with what is happening, not just to us, but to countries across Western Europe. And that means carrying on in the spirit that Rishi Sunak has shown, getting agreements with other countries that are a particular source of the issue and cracking down on this trade by working with other countries who are also having to deal with the consequences of illegal trafficking, okay. people smuggling and all the rest of it. And Mr Sunak is obviously putting small boats front and centre of, of your election campaign. Former Home Secretary Suella Braverman on the radio this morning saying there'll be a token one or two flights taking off and it's not going to work. We've got you, a former Justice Secretary, wanting the bill amended because you're not fully happy with it. That's two senior Conservatives. If neither of you is happy with it, why should voters trust the Conservatives to get this to work? Well, no, no, you see, there's a difference between wanting to get the detail of a bill right, which is my job as a scrutinising legislator, and the principle of using a third country like Rwanda. I've always agreed with it, so does Suella Braverman. The question is, can we make this work? I think that by ignoring the law and ignoring our obligations, we risk further successful legal challenge. I'm much more of the school that says you tighten it up and make sure that it is much less uh, vulnerable. Um, others, others in the Conservative parties seem to want to, you know, to, to look at withdrawing from the European Convention on Human Rights. I think that is an irrelevant issue when it comes to making a domestic policy like this work. And, and that's what now we should be focusing on. OK. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Thank Sir you. Robert Buckland. Thank you. Uh, we will talk to Aisha Hazarika and James Hill uh, in the next few minutes. We're going to talk about Donald Trump now, though, because in New York, the opening statements in Mr Trump's historic hush money trial finally began. Prosecutors accused the former president of, quote, election fraud, pure and simple, falsifying business records in order to cover up an attempt to influence the 2016 presidential election. Mr Trump denies all 34 charges. Specifically, the prosecution say he tried to buy the silence of Stormy Daniels, an adult film star who says she had an affair with Mr Trump 10 years before. 
prosecution has also tried to frame the trial not as a sex scandal but as another case of Mr Trump's attempts to interfere with elections. The defence said today there's nothing wrong with trying to influence an election. It's called democracy. After hearing the opening arguments from the prosecution and defence as well as the first witness, Mr Trump emerged from court to say this. This is a Biden witch hunt to keep me off the campaign trail. So far, it's not working because my poll numbers are higher than they've ever been because the public understands that it's a witch hunt. Stormy Daniels was on Newsnight back in 2018. Here she explains why she told the world about her alleged affair with Mr. Trump. You know, I actually don't make it a habit to kiss and tell. I feel, you know, part of me feels guilty about doing that. But by recounting every detail, I think it's obvious that I know things that only someone who had actually experienced and been there would know. And I would have never included any of those things or, you know, um, kissed and tell for, you know, lack of a better explanation if it wasn't for the fact that I was being called a liar. Stormy Daniels back in 2018. Let's talk live to Miles Taylor, who used to work in the Department for Homeland Security under Donald Trump and Katerina Joino, who's covering the Trump trial for Rolling Stone. Hello, both of you. Thank you very much for talking to our British audience. Uh, Katrina, you were in court. How much of a moment was this today? It was fascinating. I mean, firstly, it's the first day of opening statements from both the, the prosecutor and the defense. We have the prosecutor saying that Trump was a frugal businessman that he pinches pennies. And for that reason alone, he would never in his right mind pay double the asking price of the debt that he owed Michael Cohen. And you have the defense saying, if he's such a frugal businessman, and he obviously was irked by that comment, the defense is saying that he would clearly also prove his innocence, and that he would never pay. He just was owing this man what he owed him. Mm. You like, also have the first set of, of testimony from the first witness, which is David Packer. And just to remind people, Michael Cohen, um, Trump's former lawyer, who himself was jailed for three years, if I recall correctly, for uh, various charges. What was Donald Trump's body language like today? He was, it seemed like he was struggling to stay awake. Uh, Rolling Stone last week, we, yeah, we came out with an article about this. Uh, last week during jury selection, it was a full uh, week of trying to figure 12 exact jurors plus six alternates. And it could get a little boring. Uh, if I were on trial, I would not try to fall asleep. He was seen uh, by New York Times reporter Maggie Haberman having his jaw go slack. And after she made this comment on public on live TV on CNN, he came back into the courtroom, glared at her. So we came out with an article saying that he privately is raged by this comment. And today he was struggling very much so to stay awake. His body language would keep on jerking as if he were trying to just keep on uh, listening to the trial. Right. What's the key argument from the prosecution? What's the key argument from the defense? They're arguing that he clearly knew that he falsified 34 counts of you know, business transactions to hide the reimbursement of $130,000 in hush money payments to Stormy Daniels. The defense is saying he was just clearly paying his lawyer and he had no prior knowledge of these hush money payments. And more importantly, I can you say yourself, it's not illegal to influence an election. They were clearly just payments that he owed to his lawyer for doing a great job. And they're trying to discredit Michael Cohen now as trying to have financial gain to see Trump's destruction. OK, uh, let's bring in Miles then. Uh, Donald Trump has obviously been watching you commentate on his trial because he called you out on Truth Social. He said so many lightweights and fakes going on MSNBC and CNN purporting to know me as though they were a long lost relative only to have virtually no knowledge of me or anything about me. A weak and pathetic rhino, Republican in name only, named Miles Taylor. How do you plead? <laughs> I mean, what do you even say to that? I, you know, look, I, I think the bigger concern, Victoria, would be after spending time with the man on Air Force One and in the White House Situation Room and the Oval Office, if he doesn't remember me, it's a it's a pretty damning indictment of his memory. So, um, uh, you know, but there but there's the photo evidence to show it. I think the bigger concern here and, and, and the way it ties back to the case, Vic, is is you, you see that the ex president is willing to claim really anything uh, if it tries to benefit his case. In, in this case, a, a, a very obvious lie that he didn't know me after serving two years as his chief of staff at the Department of Homeland Security. But again, you know, we see him in this case pretending uh, he was unaware of a 
you know, payment to his lawyer that was directed uh, for a, a catch and kill purpose, a hush money purpose, when I think almost any viewer of this case, any observer of this case would see that that's quite clearly false. I mean, what a coincidence in timing that these exact dollar amounts would result in the bank account of this individual uh, who then went quiet about the allegations. I mean, it's too many coincidences. Uh, it's clearly Donald Trump uh, trying to mount a defense, and and it's unclear yet if he's going to be able to sustain a defense against these 34 counts. But you cannot overstate the significance here, and I think that's really what we saw this week. Is is I, I think that's sending shockwaves through the American political establishment that we are indeed seeing a president on criminal trial. Well, a it, sure, it will be up to the jury to decide whether they are more than coincidences. Of course, Mr. Trump says it's a witch hunt. Do you not have any concerns that 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 this might be political. Well, you know, I think if you look at the at the actual indictment itself, I mean, what you see here are the facts. And what this will be is a litmus test for the American justice system. I think there's no evidence whatsoever to indicate that Joe Biden or his Justice Department in any way, shape or form have uh, have conspired to try to bring these allegations. It's an absurd claim. It's one that doesn't stand up to the light. What is worrying, Vic, is that the claim that there's a conspiracy to prosecute Donald Trump has indeed brainwashed a lot of people from my po po political persuasion, a lot of conservatives in the United States, to believe that that's true, despite any evidence of such. And that's really alarming. And, and, and we're seeing that in the polls, that Americans' confidence in the justice system is plummeting with Trump's attacks on it, uh, and and I think it remains to be seen how that's going to affect uh, this election, and and you know if Donald Trump should win re-election, what that might mean for the U.S. Department of Justice. Well, what might it mean in your view? Well, look, after serving for a couple of years with him, I mean, what I'll tell you is he had a very very keen interest in using the levers of the Justice Department for his own personal interests and to go after his enemies, and and that would sound like. Uh, a gross overstatement in any other time period, but Donald Trump has said that himself. Uh, he's gone out there and made clear that he will use the U.S. Department of Justice as a tool of retribution, as a tool of revenge against his political enemies, all the way up to and including Joe Biden if he wins re-election. So if right now Donald Trump is saying the U.S. Department of Justice is politicized, again, of which there is no evidence, what we know to be true is if he wins re-election, his stated intent is to weaponize that department and use it for political purposes and for retribution. Uh, and that should raise the hairs on anyone's skin, regardless of their political party. Miles, thank you. Katrina, thank you very much. Do come back soon. Thank you. Right, from New York to Westminster, let's go back to Nick. Uh, what is happening right now, Nick? Well, Vic, the latest is that that vote from the House of Commons will go before the House of Lords at 11.45, the next half hour or so. And as I was saying to you earlier, it is not expected there'll be any more amendments coming back to the Commons, so the expectation is that it'll be done and dusted by midnight. That means that the Prime Minister can land in Poland tomorrow in a good mood, where he's going to announce an extra £500 million in aid aid for Ukraine. He's meeting Donald Tusk, uh, the Prime Minister of Poland, and Jens Stoltenberg, who's the Secretary General of NATO. I was saying that the flights can't get underway for 10 to 12 weeks, but as soon as that bill becomes law, and we need the King's signature, the Royal Assent for that happen, there are things that the government can do, and they can start detaining people ahead of their removal. And the Prime Minister today was talking about having an extra 2,500 spaces for detention. Thank you. Right, let's talk again to Aisha Hazarika and James Heal, uh, former Labour advisor. Aisha is, as you probably know, uh, currently Times Radio host and James Heal, political correspondent for The Spectator magazine. Why is it taking 10 to 12 weeks to get a plane off if indeed a plane does take off? Well, I think part of what Nick was saying there about detention and then also making sure that it's absolute belt and braces approach, because we all know what's happened before in terms of those pyjama injunctions right now. Uh, you know, when previously people were literally on the plane ready to be taken off, mm. uh, and that's why they need to be making sure that they're not going to have any of those kind of repeats. But so. I don't understand why the processing hasn't already begun. Well, because they wanted to make sure they were under the law, um, you know, right. in terms okay. of that was, that was what was key. Um, and I think talking to government, that's why they've taken a more sort of hair, a, a tortoise approach rather than the hair, making sure they wanted to make sure all the legislation was going to be as safe and watertight as possible. Uh, rather than kind of rush this through and then have another farce where, again, the plane resigns and you don't have any more parliamentary time for legislation. Right. Sir Robert Buckland was telling us, was mentioning the European Court of Human Rights. 
after the next election, if Labour win, if there's a Tory leadership contest, is that going to be the sort of the issue amongst those going for the leadership of the Tory party, do you think? I think it's going to be really interesting to see um, what the sort of right of the Conservative Party uh, feel about this Rwanda policy and I think the test of it will be when we get to sort of June, July and we see how many flights are really going off and also what reform says about this as well because mm -hmm. reform is nipping at the Conservatives' heel. The, the, the last set of polls you had the Conservatives on 19%, you have reform on 13%. Now I think for that sort of um, the more right-wing end of Conservative thinking this is just not good enough for them. Yes, Rishi Sunak might be very happy tomorrow when he does his kind of global statesman thing and he might feel really good about himself saying, yes, I've got this on the statute books, it's happening. But you will have the right saying this is not good enough because, to James's point, if there are going to be any more legal challenges, it won't be enough for the right of, of, of British politics. They will say, no, 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 the next thing you've got to do is you've got to commit to leaving the European Court on Human Rights. Now, Rishi Sunak is not in that place yet. There's big divisions within the Conservative Party about this. I've spoken to Conservative MPs who've said, look, I spoke to John Hayes a couple of weeks ago on my show. He said, if Rishi Sunak is really serious about this, he should commit now to saying he's going to leave the European Convention on Human Rights. He now, says he, well, he says he yeah. doesn't need to. He said that today, I didn't he? I think right now there's much more a sense of operating in the tradition of the centre-right and trying to keep both camps happy in the sense of, well, we might cross that bridge when we come to it. Right. But equally, there's also a step forward that where you can ignore ECHR rulings and um, that will keep us within the ECHR. So I don't think we're at the stage yet where we're talking about ruling, you know, leaving the ECHR. But whenever the next Tory leadership mm. contest is, that's going to be a thing, isn't I it? I suspect it will be a theme. And I remember, I think, in 2022, Suella Ravman did want that right yes. then. It didn't stop her then serving in a government that was committed to the ECHR. She's now said we obviously should leave it since then. Sure. Um, so I think it'll be one issue. But I think, I don't think Rwanda will be the be all and end all when it comes Does, to migration. Can I just ask you, James, sure. here, with your, with your contacts with it amongst the Conservative Party and the government, does this bill protect Rishi Sunak from those restive backbenchers who are terrified of losing a thousand seats in the local elections and terrified of losing the general election? There will be certain members within Rishi Sunak's parliamentary party who will, I think, dislike him no matter what. Uh, so I don't think it will protect him from certain discordant voices on certain sections of the right. Equally, I think a lot of MPs have been there, seen the time that he's invested and actually think, you know, he is really passionate about this. The question is whether the ob objects against him were too great at this stage of the parliamentary calendar, five years into a five-year government. But I think we've got to be realistic. I mean, Number 10 will be very pleased about what happens tonight and Rishi Sunak will breathe a, a sigh of relief. But if we take a step back, let's just look at what the polls are doing. We just had Ipsos come out with a poll this week putting Rishi Sunak you know, on, on the sort of worst polling that has been in, in the history of Ipsos's, you know, recording mm. of, of polls. Since Rishi Sunak has come in, he has made this Rwanda policy above all else his flagship policy, and the polls have not moved at all. In fact, he is now as unpopular as Jeremy Corbyn was. He's as unpopular as John Major was before that landslide. So it feels that for all the focus on Rwanda, the other thing is since this time last year, the small boats crossings have gone up by 24%. So even though he he is talking really tough on this. The polls aren't moving and the channel crossings aren't moving. James, I know you want to come in. Yeah. We are literally out of time. I'm ah. so sorry. Right. I'm so sorry. No worries. Do come back. Thank you so, so much, both of you. Really Thank appreciate you. it. And thanks for your patience as well. That is all from us tonight. Goodbye. Back tomorrow.